What's up guys? So today is our first lecture of the semester and we are going to kick things off with a Chem 1310 review. So this isn't going to be all encompassing of everything that you covered in the last class. This is just going to cover the topics that you need to be proficient at in order to be successful in Chem 1320. Okay, so let's get started with IUPAC. So what is IUPAC? So IUPAC is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And what they've done is develop a set of systematic rules that we use to name organic compounds. So unless you're told otherwise, I want you to use the IUPAC rules for naming. But unfortunately, since you guys wanna be nurses for the most part, there are some common names that you're going to have to learn as well. Okay, so the prefixes for IUPAC naming. We're gonna cover the first 10 prefixes in this course, and I want to be clear that these are not the same prefixes you used last semester for naming binary compounds. The prefixes you're going to learn today equate to the number of carbon atoms we have in an organic molecule. So let's go over those prefixes. So if we have one carbon, the prefix is meth. If we have two carbons, eth. Three, prop. Four is bute, five is pent, six is hex, seven hept, H-E-P-T, eight oct, O-C-T, nine is known, N-O-N, ten dec, D-E-C. So in this class, we're going to draw almost everything as a skeletal structure. So unless I tell you otherwise, I want your answer as a skeletal structure. So a skeletal structure is where the covalent bonds are represented by lines. We don't show carbons. And hydrogens are only drawn when attached to a non-carbon atom. So let's look at an example of a skeletal structure. So to read a skeletal structure, you're going to assume carbon atoms appear at the end of each line and where bonds meet. Okay, so I want you to look at this structure to the right, pause the video, and see if you can count how many carbons there are in this molecule. Okay, so let's count. So here's the end of a line, so that's one carbon. Here's where two bonds meet, so that's two carbons. Here's where bonds meet, so that's three. Here's the end of a line, so that's four where two bonds meet, five, where two bonds meet, six, and the end of the line is seven. Okay, so now a bit of a harder question. So you told me there were seven carbons in this molecule. How many hydrogens are there in this molecule? So if you need a little bit of a refresher on this, turn back to section 4.1 of your textbook and read page 118. But the big takeaway from that section is the number of covalent bonds that a non-metal atom forms is generally going to be the same as the number of electrons that it needs to gain an octet. So carbon has four valence electrons, so that means that it needs four more in order to gain an octet. So in general, carbon is going to make four bonds. So each of these seven carbons in this molecule should be making four bonds. And remember, with skeletal structures, hydrogens attached to carbons are implied. They're not shown. So go ahead and look at this structure again, pause the video, and see if you can tell me how many hydrogens this molecule has. Okay, let's go by and count the hydrogens one carbon atom at a time. So we know we have seven carbons, and we're going to figure out how many hydrogens we have. So this first carbon right here is bonded to one carbon, and each carbon is going to want four bonds total, so that means there has to be three hydrogens attached to this carbon. Okay, let's look at this next one. This next one right here is bonded to two carbons, which leaves two bonds remaining for hydrogens. Okay, this next carbon, it's bonded to one, two, three carbons, leaving room for only one hydrogen. This terminal carbon up here is only bonded to one carbon, so that leaves room for three hydrogens. This next one is bonded directly to two carbons, leaving room for two hydrogens. 
Same thing for this next one. It's bonded to two carbons, leaving room for two hydrogens. And we have another terminal carbon that's only bonded to one carbon. So that means there's room for three hydrogens. Okay, let's add all this up. So we have three plus two is five plus one is six plus three is nine plus two is 11 plus two is 13 plus three is 16. So that means the molecular formula of this molecule is C7H16. Okay, so now that you have a bit of a refresher on skeletal structures, I wanna talk about the proper way to draw skeletal structures. So a skeletal structure needs to have realistic bond angles and the correct formal charges. And it should be clear which atoms are connected by which bonds. So let's try some examples and I'll show you what not to do when drawing skeletal structures. So example one, let's draw a proper skeletal structure for acetone. Okay, so which one of these acetone structures is correct? So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can answer that question. So the first one is correct. The reason it's correct is we wanna look at the geometry at the central carbon atom. So the central carbon atom has trigonal planar geometry. So that means we're going to have three 120 degree angles. Now I'm not saying you need to get out a protractor and actually physically measure the angles of all your drawings, but try your best to make all three of these angles equal. And so that's what's wrong with the other three structures here. In the second structure, are all three angles approximately equal? No, we have two small angles and then one huge angle. Same thing for these other two structures. One small angle, one medium angle, one huge angle. Two medium angles, one huge angle. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but you wanna try your best to replicate the actual geometry on paper. Okay, let's try another example. So let's try to draw a proper skeletal structure for dimethylamine. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can tell me which one of these structures is correct and what is wrong with the other structures. Okay, so for this one, there's actually two acceptable structures and let's look at each of them. So unlike the last one, which had trigonal planar geometry, this one is not planar. This one is trigonal pyramidal. So these bond angles are going to be a little bit less than 120. But when we draw this structure, we still want to spread them out as far as possible. And this first structure is doing a good job of that. So why is the second structure correct? So the only difference in the first and the second structure is that we didn't draw a line connecting the nitrogen to the hydrogen. And that is acceptable in skeletal structures. We can save space by writing the hydrogen next to whichever atom it's bonded to, and that's going to save a lot of space when we get to more complex structures. Okay, what about this third one? What is wrong with the third structure? Well, we don't have the atoms spread out as far as possible. We have a good angle right here, but this one's too small, and this one is way too big. Okay, what about this fourth structure? What is wrong with this one? So our angles look pretty good. This is a good angle going from carbon, nitrogen, carbon. But it looks like this hydrogen is attached to two different atoms. It looks like it's attached to the central nitrogen. And it looks like this bond drawn right here is connecting our hydrogen to this terminal methyl group. Okay, so let's look at this last one. So the obvious thing that is wrong with this is we're missing a hydrogen. So remember, hydrogens are only implied attached to carbons. For any other atom, we have to actually draw in the hydrogen. So let's say this structure was drawn correctly, that there was not supposed to be another hydrogen there. If that's the case, let's go ahead and fill in an octet for our nitrogen. So we have two electrons making up this bond right here, two electrons making up that bond, so in order to get eight electrons around this nitrogen, we need to add two lone pair. Okay, so what is the formal charge on this nitrogen now? So the formal charge is going to be equal to the number of valence electrons on an atom minus the number of non-bonding electrons minus the number of bonds. 
So nitrogen appears in group five of the periodic table, so it should have five valence electrons. We have four non-bonding electrons, and we have two bonds. So the formal charge on this nitrogen, five minus four minus two is negative one. So if for some reason you meant to draw this structure without a hydrogen attached to the nitrogen, you would have to include the correct formal charge. Okay, let's try another example. So let's draw a proper skeletal structure for 2-butyne. CH3, C triple bonded C, CH3. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can tell me which one of these structures is correct and what is wrong with the other structures. Okay, so this fourth structure is the only correct one because it is the only one with realistic bond angles. So let's think about the molecular geometry at these central carbons. So remember carbon makes four bonds. So we have three bonds going to the next carbon and one bond going to the terminal carbon. One plus three is four, so there's no room for any hydrogens. So these two bonds are going to be spread apart as far as possible. So we have a linear geometry here. So whenever you have a triple bonded carbon, the geometry at that carbon must be linear. So let's look at each of these other structures and see if we can figure out where and why they're wrong. So this first one, so for all of these, we're going to have two central carbons. So we're concerned with the geometry at both of these central carbons. So this one on the right is correct. We have the neighboring carbons spread out as far apart as possible, but this one on the left is incorrect. Let's look at this third one. So the geometry at both central carbons on this one is incorrect because the neighboring carbons aren't spread out as far apart as possible. And these other two, well, the geometry is correct because they are alkenes, not alkynes. Okay, let's try to put this to work. So I want you to draw a skeletal structure based on this Lewis structure below for diethyl ether. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do that. Okay, so you should have something that looks similar to this right here. It doesn't have to look exactly like that. For instance, you could have started by drawing your first bond down, then up, like so. Doesn't matter, either of these will work. Okay, let's try to draw a skeletal structure based on condensed structures. So this first molecule is 2-fluorobutane, and the second molecule is something that we're gonna be working with later this semester in lab. So go ahead, pause the video, and try drawing these two structures on your own. Okay, so hopefully you drew something that looks similar to this. Like I said before, there are multiple ways you can draw this. For instance, I could rotate this 2-fluorobutane and draw it like this. And that is just as correct as the first one. And the second molecule is aspirin, and there's a lot of ways you could have rotated this molecule and represented it in two dimensions. Okay, so in addition to the first 10 IUPAC prefixes, which we talked about earlier, there are four special prefixes that you need to know. So the first one is isoprop. That is a three carbon group that's connected at the middle carbon. So take a look at the structure right here. So we have one, two, three, and it's connected to something called R. So we use R sometimes to simplify a complex molecule so that we can just focus on the important part. Okay, based on what isoprop is, what do you think isobute is? So isobute is four carbons that look like a Y. So it's essentially isoprop plus one more carbon. So we have four carbons in the shape of a Y connected to whatever our parent chain is. Okay, this next one is tert butte. And these are four carbons that look like a T. So one, two, three, four. So the prefix tert comes from tertiary. So tertiary means third order or third rank. So where does that come into play with organic chemistry? So let's look at this R group or our parent chain, whatever it is. The carbon attached to that R group is tertiary. It's attached to one, two, three other carbons. So based on that definition, 
what do you think a sec butte group is? So sec butte, four carbons in a straight line connected at the middle. So one, two, three, four. And once again, let's look at the carbon attached to our R group. That is a secondary carbon because it is attached to one, two carbons.